together again and uh, great to have Bryden for the first time in the flesh. So good to you. <laughs> Let me open in prayer and then we'll get going. Well, Father, what a joy it is to be amongst your people and to have your word open in front of us and to to sit expectantly um, waiting to hear from you because that is what happens when your word is read and studied and explained. Uh, we hear the very words of God. So won't you be with us and by your spirit, won't you help us understand what is written, especially here in the book of Daniel, which uh, can be quite cryptic and obscure. So please um, help us to understand clearly what this is teaching us about yourself and more particularly about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. All right. So do you remember right in the beginning of the course in Luke when Jesus is uh, on the road to Emmaus and uh, his disciples are pretty bleak with life and he, um, they don't recognize him and uh, eventually they do. And from that point on, he explains to them how um, all of the scriptures are about him. Um, and that includes the book of Daniel, I take it, is about Jesus. <laughs> so that's what we must uh, expect to see. We, we don't arrive... Um, at the Bible with, uh, with what's the word, uh, with an unbiased view. We arrive at the Bible with the view that it's about Jesus, because he said so. And so as we go through Daniel, let's try and bear that in mind, because there's so many red herrings, and I've heard some weird and wonderful teachings from the book of Daniel. And we don't want to, we don't want to miss the point that it's actually in the end about Jesus. So just a quick recap, uh, do you remember we saw last time that the kingdom of Israel splits into the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, where from now on Israel talks, is, is talking about uh, a small kingdom of ten tribes up north, and Judah is the kingdom of two tribes down south, where the Jews come from Judah, and Jerusalem is the capital, Samaria is the capital of Israel up in, in the north, it was originally founded, do you remember, by Jeroboam, while, his, uh, while Solomon's son Rehoboam founded the kingdom of Judah down south. So the, the prophets were sent by God to warn the kings to turn back, to stop their idolatry or to face judgment, to face exile in particular. But neither kingdom listened. And so Israel, I'm going to just uh, jump over these slides quickly. Israel was exiled uh, and conquered by Assyria in 722 BC. Um, Judah lasted 150 years longer, but they too refused to listen to the prophets, and they were exiled to Babylon, and by Babylon, um, in a couple of different stages, 597, 586 were the two big ones. Um, but in ver at various times, Babylon came to teach them a lesson and drag more of them off uh, to be prisoners of war in Babylon. Um, and so that's where we sit. Israel is now divided. The people of Israel, the people of God, have no land. They've got no temple. The temple down south was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, no king, although God had promised in 1000 BC. David's easy to remember. He lived in 1000 BC, so I could always remember his, his time. 1000 BC, God had said to David, a son from your line, remember, uh, I will sit on the throne of my people and he will rule forever. A wonderful, extravagant promise, but there's no sign of such a king at this point. Um, the people are dragged, kicking and screaming out of Israel, off to Babylon. It really does look like God has deserted them. But we know he hadn't, because God continues to raise up prophets. He, he wouldn't keep warning a people that he didn't care about. Uh, that's the thing about God, is that, you know, what's the best form uh, of attack? Well, to do it quietly, to do it at an unexpected time, at, like a thief of the night. But God doesn't do that. He warns people long before any judgment comes. Why? Because he loves them, because he's such a reluctant judge. And so he sends warning after warning after warning, which is exactly what you don't do in the army. Broadcast the coming of a threat. You know, you, you, you just ambush. But God doesn't ambush anyone. He raises up people like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, to explain to the people in exile why it had happened to them. You can imagine someone born in exile wouldn't necessarily know the whole history, would just think God's been mean, why does he do this to us? Uh, but these prophets, um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, are exilic prophets. So let me just jump back to this slide that we've kind of looked at, just uh, the chronological history of Israel. It doesn't matter if you can't actually read the writing, 
uh, Judah, the history of Judah's down the left, Israel's down the right. Uh, we know, oh, I sneak through. Uh, here's the exile to Assyria um, of the northern kingdom, and the southern kingdom lasts 150 years later. And then there are two main exiles, deportations to Babylon. And while they're in Babylon for these 70 years, uh, Ezekiel is sent. Uh, the book of Lamentations is written. Daniel is sent um, to, to minister to the people in exile to explain to them why this is happening to them and to give them hope that it's not going to last forever. Um, and so where we are in the whole timeline is we're looking at this period of the exile, the 70 years, and uh, the period um, just up to the time before they come back. 586, they return, so it's the, the exilic prophets speak to the people up to that point. <coughs> so, um, where am I? Let me go back to the slide. Uh, chapter 1 presents us with an overview of the exile. Uh, it picks up the story where the book of two kings ends off, um, and it starts off with Nebuchadnezzar in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, the southern kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. I was about to, as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim from the king. But no, no, no. The Lord delivered the king of Judah into the hand of a pagan enemy king, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon is pictured as Satan and hell, often in the Bible. And when you get to Revelation, you know, Babylon, Babylon the Great, and everything from Babylon is wrong. Babel, Tower of Babel, it was in Babylon, and, and Nebuchadnezzar is the greatest threat to the Lord's people. He's a picture of, of Satan. And here God is delivering his people, not the northern kingdom, the, the, the um, idolatrous kingdom of the north, Israel, but the southern kingdom of Judah, the kingdom that all his kings and in fact his Messiah is going to come from, he delivers them into the hand of um, Nebuchadnezzar, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these Nebuchadnezzar ca carried off to the temple of his God, the treasure house of his God. Now, my goodness, you know, no one just waltzes into the temple of the living God and plunders it. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar does. Why? Because he's actually a servant of the Lord at this point. Uh, he is doing exactly what God's raised him up to do. And uh, suddenly the Jews are absolutely shocked that someone can lay their, their, their pagan hands on the sacred items of the temple in Babylonia. I mean, what on earth is going on here? Um, some of these people he took to Babylon, praying to indoctrinate, uh, to reprogram. Uh, he wanted to make them Babylonians. That was kind of his foreign policy for prisoners of war. Um, among those, four men especially are introduced to us. Um, Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Shadrach Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, they live well. Uh, they are taught extensively about Babylonian culture. They're even given new names, one of whom is Daniel. Now, while Daniel is happy to cooperate with the authorities by eating vegetables and drinking water, he resolves not to defile himself or to compromise by eating the king's food or drinking the king's wine. So in chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. So why not? Why on earth would Daniel do that? Why does he very um, respectfully ask permission not to eat the royal food. The Levitical law, Jewish law, did not forbid drinking wine. Uh, later in chapter 10, uh, Daniel says that he had been drinking wine up to the point of making this vow. So chapter 10, verse 2 and 3, at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, uh, no meat or, or wine, sorry. I ate no choice food and no meat or wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until three weeks were over. So it seems like at that point he stopped drinking wine. Uh, is this a time that like Daniel has just decided, okay, I've got to draw a line somewhere. I don't want to be uh, indoctrinated. I don't want to be, uh, you know, 
absorbed into the Babylonian culture and so far no further. What's going on? No, there's something else going on here. It's much more likely that Daniel would have read Isaiah chapter 22, <laughs> okay, which he definitely would have done. Isaiah had lived just before Daniel, and so the book of, of Isaiah uh, was well known. And Isaiah 22 speaks of what was going to happen at the time that God's judgment fell on God's people. And verse 12 of that chapter says that God would call for weeping and mourning from his people. But instead of weeping and mourning, what would he see? There would be drinking wine and eating joyfully, saying those famous words that Paul quotes in Corinthians, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. So God's people just completely ignore the fact they're under God's judgment. Daniel doesn't want to be like a typical one of God's people who, who, um, who just insult God like that. He will not revel during judgment. He knows that this is judgment. He knows this Um, for more of the same on that day, it says Isaiah, to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair, to put on sacrifice, slaughtering of cattle, killing of, my, of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, let us say, for tomorrow we die. So they are not taking this judgment seriously. They are not learning from this. They're just saying, well, whatever will be, will be, says, Sarah, Sarah, let's repent. Not. Daniel says, no, I'm going to take this one seriously, and I'm not going to eat. And, um, God causes the Babylonian officials to show Daniel favor, and his initial diet causes him and his friends to look better than anyone else. And God makes them ten times, we're told, more knowledgeable than anyone else. So verse 17 of chapter 1, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds, and at the end of the time, set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which, about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Okay. Now, verse 21 is quite strange in that it actually doesn't need to be there. It seems completely superfluous. At verse 21, Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, what is that showing us? Cyrus was the king who came and took over from Nebuchadnezzar. So while you've got to understand the history of Israel and the division into north and south, Israel and Judah, on, within Israel history, you've also got to understand that in, um, uh, um, what's the word, ancient Near East, there was also big changes happening. First, there was Assyria, who were the, 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 you know, the king of the castle. And then Babylon, with Nebuchadnezzar, took over from Assyria and beat them up and took over the world. And then Persia took over from Babylon and, and, and gave Nebuchadnezzar a hide. comes to the throne. And here we've been told that Daniel remained in Babylon right through the entire exile, even to the point where Cyrus had defeated Nebuchadnezzar, and now Persia is running the world. Uh, this guy, Cyrus, is the guy, we'll come across him later in this course, who allows the Jews of Judah to go back to Judah. Um, God takes them back, and they rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, um, Haggai and uh, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, those guys. So Daniel lived throughout the whole exile for 70 years, uh, we're being told. And this opening description of Daniel helps us to see that he stood firm in small things. You know, he took little things seriously, which enabled him to stand firm in bigger things, because bigger things are coming against Daniel soon in this book. But in this little matter of food and drink, he knew Isaiah 22. He said, I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to obey the word of my king, uh, the Lord. There are much, much bigger temptations coming to Daniel, which he would not have been able to stand up to had he given in at this point. Now, the story... Uh, Oh, sorry, I had this verse that, uh, for you to follow from Isaiah 22. 
I called you to weep and mourn. Instead, I see joy and revelry. And God is not. Now, the story of chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 2 to 7, is spoken, is, is taught the chiasm. And we've come across this Hebrew literary structure or technique before, okay, where everything builds up to a crescendo in the middle. Um, and you have the mirror imaging of events. So we find in chapter 2 and chapter 7, uh, we have visions, okay? In chapter 3 and chapter 6, uh, we have of kings um, rescuing Daniel, and in the middle, we've got judgment on Nebuchadnezzar and judgment on Belshazzar, his successor. Um, so that, there's this chiasm that we're going to be working through um, as, as we see things mirroring each other, chapter 2, 7, 3, 6. So 2 and 7 are all about dreams. 3 and 6 are about persecution and God's rescue of Daniel from that persecution, the lion's den. Uh, are about the clash of kingdoms between God and the kingdom of, of Babylon. So the king of Bab Babylon thinks he's an equal to God. You know, who's who, a bit like Pharaoh. You know, who are you? I don't know this God. Written in Aramaic as this says here, yeah, Aramaic in the third person, and then the last chapter in the first and third person. Uh, that's important because the rest of the whole Old Testament is Hebrew, not Aramaic. So why would God have some of his Bible written in a foreign tongue, other than to be understood by foreigners? Why would it be important for these chapters to be written in a foreign tongue, or the tongue of the Babylonians? Well, because it's a warning to them. God doesn't want to spring or ambush them with judgment. <laughs> He wants to save them. He loves them too. They are also part of his people. The world. He, remember the promise to Abraham? Through you I will bless the world, the nations. And so I take it that um, God speaking in Aramaic to the kings of Babylon, the two kings of Babylon, is, is an appeal to them to surrender. And we're going to see what happens. It's a, it's a fascinating story. The king, these two kings of Babylon. I absolutely love it. Uh, God is interested in Gentiles as well as his exiled Jewish people. That's what we've got to remember. So let's look at that first one, chapter 2 and then chapter 7, the dreams. Chapter 2 begins with Nebuchadnezzar having a dream. He's desperate for an interpretation of the dream. He calls his wise men in uh, and says, he, it's a tall order. You guys, I'm not asking you to tell me uh, what my dream meant. I'm asking you to tell me what I, I dreamt. Now you've got to really be, and then what? And then what? You can tell me what I dreamt. Then tell me what it meant. So it's a real test for them, isn't it? Because you might just be lucky, you know, uh, a bit like these fortune tellers. Oh, anyone here with a sore back? Yeah, you know, or uh, someone had an aunt who's died recently. You know, you can do that. You can kind of work things out. No, no, no. He says, you tell me what I dreamt, and then you tell me what it means. Well, they say this is completely unreasonable, as you would expect. Um, it's a bit of a mirror of Pharaoh's dreams. Do you remember? With the baker and all of that. Um, he says that reward will come to the one who can tell him what he dreamt and interpret it, and death would come to the, those who, who failed. You know, so it's a cushy job being a wise man until something like this comes along. They say that this is impossible, and they're about to be killed along with Daniel and his friends. Because they are also wise, do you remember? They are now counted among the wisest of the land, so they're also consulted. And just as the sword is about to fall on all the wise men of Babylon, uh, Daniel pleads with God. He prays to God to give him the dream and the interpretation of the dream. He then goes to Nebuchadnezzar and tells Nebuchadnezzar that only God can interpret dreams, which is a really important point. He's not claiming anything special. He says, I can't interpret dreams. We always think that Daniel and Joseph are dream interpreters. They're not. God is. And through and God can speak through someone like Joseph or Daniel about what the dream means. Um, God, he says, has told them what the dream is and what the dream means. And in verses 31 through to 35, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar what he dreamt and then interprets it. And here comes the dream. I'm going to read it. You keep your eye on the screen. This is what he says. Your majesty, uh, sorry, in the dream, your majesty looked, and there before you 
stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms were made of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not of human hands. It struck the statue on the feet of iron and clay, smashed them. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in summer. The wind swept them away without a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mark. It's quite a you can't guess that, I take it. That wasn't just a lucky guess. Now, he's got to interpret what this dream is. So maybe I'll go through it like this. He says, Neza is the head of gold. So these, these various uh, uh, elements, head, shoulders, torso, legs, feet, are representing different kingdoms that are going to rise, world empires. And he says that this, the first world empire, now actually you could have gone back and said before that was Assyria, and before that was Egypt. But anyway, he starts in the present. He says, the first kingdom that God is wanting to talk to you about is your kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar. And you are the head of gold. He is head, in other words, over all the other kingdoms. All the other kingdoms come under him, follow him chronologically, but actually they flow from him as well. His power had come to him because God had given him power. He is the king because God has made him king. It's a bit like Romans, what's it, uh, Romans 13. You know, God establishes governments and puts you know, people in place. And that should make a ruler humble. When you realize that the power that you've got has only been on, is only on loan, it actually belongs to God. It should keep rulers humble, but of course it never does. Um, especially because we're told that his kingdom is not going to last forever. A rock is coming. It's going to smash this kingdom to pieces. And God is going to replace these kingdoms of the earth with a rock, a rock that grows and grows and grows to become a mountain that fills the earth. In other words, a kingdom that is not going to be regional. It's not going to be a small little kingdom occupying a small part of the planet. But when God's kingdom comes, it's going to consume the world. The whole world will be the kingdom of God. Uh, it's also going to be much bigger than Nebuchadnezzar's, better than Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, because it's not only bigger, but it's also eternal. So in verse 44 and 45, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not with human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy, says Daniel uh, to the king. So who are these other kingdoms? Well, there's been tons of speculation, uh, you know, all the way down to, well, you know, uh, the, that's Babylon and uh, this would be Rome and this would be the Nazis and this would be the Soviets and, and I, I've heard wonderful fantastic sermons on this statue. But I think when you look at the history of the world history from Nebuchadnezzar, there are these four great kingdoms. There is uh, the Babylonians, then followed by the Persians, the Med Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Greek, Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire, followed by the Roman Empire. And then guess who arrives during the middle of the Roman occupation of the world? The rock. Not cut by human hands, but delivered by God. And I think it's quite simple what these kingdoms are. It's talking about a Christ who's going to come. Remember, the, the time is near, the kingdom of God. Sorry, what does he say in Mark, Mark? The time has come, the kingdom of God is. I've come to usher in the kingdom of God that is going to eventually replace all Okay, now, nothing for Nebuchadnezzar to hear. Okay, this is really telling him his future. Uh, but think about what this would have meant to the exiles, to the Jews, especially the faithful Jews, like Daniel and his friends living 
uh, God-fearing lives in Babylon, trying to honor the Lord while they're prisoners of war in Babylon. Put yourself in their shoes and you hear this. It's an encouraging thing, isn't it? Don't panic, basically. Jesus is on the throne. God rules. I know you're prisoners of war. I know you, you know, 70 years is a long time to be locked up away from home. Uh, and actually, it's not going to get much better because there are three, three more oppressive empires coming to oppress the Jews. But don't worry. Don't worry. God's got this. And the rock is on its way. A rock is on its way. Uh, God's kingdom, he hasn't forgotten his promises. He hasn't forgotten his promises of an eternal king coming to reign over an eternal kingdom. Do you remember 2 Samuel 7, that amazing chapter where God promises David, someone from your flesh, from someone from your, your family will rule forever. And that's been repeated now to the exiles. Don't worry, God hasn't forgotten his promise to Dan, David 500 years ago. God is in control. Their hardship will come to an end because their king, God's king, is on his way. In other words, the covenants that God has made, the promises that he has made all the way from the beginning are still on track. Uh, every single one of them. Nothing, nothing is falling apart yet. So the chapter ends on a really high note. Um, absolutely incredibly, at the end of chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, who's the most, you know, he's the... Um, he's the, the leader of the superpower of the world, seems to acknowledge, acknowledge Daniel's God. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Sounds like the guy has become a Christian. He's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. He's the god of gods. Okay. Um, but then comes chapter three, <laughs> the fiery furnace. Okay. So and the, the warning is there. You know, just because someone can sprout forth truths about God, I mean, Satan can sprout forth truths about God. He knows the truth about God. Think of the demons. You know, what do you want with us, Jesus? We know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. They know the truth. So in chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar builds an image and he commands all people to bow down and worship this image. If they don't, they will be cast into this fiery furnace. Um, it would have been very, very tempting, uh, don't you think? For the exiles, just to say, you know, for goodness sake, we know that this is just a thing made of rock or gold in this case. It's not living. It's not a real God. Let's just bow down to it. Um, uh, it would have been very, very tempting. Um, to kind of become synchronistic, you know, worship God in your heart, but uh, sort of outwardly do whatever the king wants to do to preserve your life. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those are their Babylonian names now given to those three friends of Daniel. Uh, they refuse to do so. They're called in, they're questioned, and they show supreme faith in God because they say that they believe he can deliver them from the, from the fiery furnace. So verses 16 through to 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the firing, the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. Notice he, they don't say he will. They just say he's able to. They fully believe that he's able to do it. Um, um, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not... Isn't that amazing, eh? Men of great faith say, we don't know the will of God. We are prepared to go along, though, with the will of God. Not, your, not my will be done. Your, even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O oh, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Um, it's amazing. Um, you know, so far from the prosperity gospel where you demand, and if you have enough faith, you'll get it. No. We, we, are, we, are, we are to follow Jesus' example. You know, Lord, if it's all possible, take this cup, heal this cancer, uh, do whatever, but not my will, your will be done. And we submit ourselves to the Lord of the universe and we trust him for what is good. As we know the story so well, God does not deliver, uh, sorry, God does deliver them. Uh, his angel, the angel, this mysterious angel of the Lord appears 
and walks around in the furnace with them. And once again, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledges their God as the only God. What do we make of this angel of the Lord? Well, it's known in theological terms as a theophany. Theophany. Uh, theo being God in Greek. Theo, theos, theology. Theophany means an appearance of God, a physical appearance of God. Um, God is spirit. Father, Son, and Spirit are spirit. Uh, until, of course, the Son comes and takes on flesh. And then you can see him and shake his hand. But until that point, you couldn't see Jesus. He was there. He was on the throne. It wasn't that he was created at, at birth. Um, but he was there. And, and there are a few instances in the Old Testament where the Lord Jesus Christ makes a shadowy appearance. Um, almost like a formless appearance, but you can see him. Uh, like this. He's with the people in the fire. Um, it's amazing. He is the one who, if you want to see the Father, you look to Jesus. You know? And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, says Jesus. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar, again, verse 28, um, they pull them out of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar says, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. What is the problem with this king's view of God? How do we know he's not a Christian yet? He's saying they're making the right noises. But he made that image. I mean, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So certainly. It's pretty circumstantial. Like when something happens and points to God. He then he's happy to acknowledge it. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't hold to that. Yeah. He's not faithful to that. Yeah. It's not, and did you notice the giveaway is in the language? Have you got it, yeah. Penny? Well, I think that, I mean, he talks about if any people, national language, he doesn't speak about yeah. He say, ah. yeah. And, and, and what he says is if any people say anything against, not my God, against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he talks about God in the third person, that God. You know, I've still got my gods, but, and, and don't you dare say anything bad about my gods. But if you also say anything bad about their gods, you'll get the same punishments as if you say something against my gods. Uh, so he, he speaks in the third person. Uh, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their God. He's not yet his God. Yeah, Jehovah is still a stranger to Nebuchadnezzar. Um, chapter 4. So look at our... our Respectively, in other words, it's not it's not a uh, uh, real time. I'm hearing myself there. It's not told in real time. It's not present tense like we've had up to now. It's 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 written from a point in the future looking back. So it's in the past tense when you when you read the language, um, uh, and it's the last time we really think about Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't feature again in the book of Daniel. In chapter four, it is Nebuchadnezzar himself speaking. So. King Nebuchadnezzar, he writes this letter to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth. And it's his letter. It's him telling the story from his perspective. He writes this letter, notice, to the whole world. Okay, he sends out an email, spam, <laughs> like serious spam, to every inbox in the whole world, get this letter. And I suppose you can do that when you're the king of you know, the ruler of the superpower of the world, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth is the address. Postman, go and deliver it like the poor guy. Oh, you've got to be serious. Okay. <laughs> and um, this, the story centers on the dreams. He goes back to the dreams. It, it is a miracle. Daniel was quite right. Only God can give the dream and interpret the dream. And it's obviously stuck in Nebuchadnezzar's head because he goes back and writes about that fact. He has another dream, though. He has a dream of a large fruitful tree that is chopped down. And again, his wise men aren't able 
or weren't able, remember this told retrospectively, they weren't able to interpret it. Daniel again was brought before the king. And he tells Nebuchadnezzar that what the meaning is. The tree, he said, is Nebuchadnezzar. It's a bit like the statue, the head of gold. That is you, Nebuchadnezzar. Powerful and dominant, this massive, strong tree. It looks like it will stand forever, but actually it's destined for destruction. Uh, and the punishment will be for this, for Nebuchadnezzar, the punishment will be eating with animals, uh, browsing and grazing like an animal. His only hope, according to Daniel, is repentance. So in chapter 4, verse 27, Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. What a brave thing to go and tell Donald Trump, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the ruler of the superpower. Twelve months later, though, we find that Nebuchadnezzar hasn't changed. He's still this arrogant ruler, and thinking that Babylon's greatness was his own doing. I just can't help but think of Donald Trump. We will make America great again. We will. Not God will, you know. Uh, you've got to be careful. When you... So here's Nebuchadnezzar strutting around on the parapet of his castle. All this time, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built? He's already been told, do you remember, the statue? lesson of the statue was that the power has been given to you by God. No, 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 he did, he's forgotten that. This is the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Oh my goodness. Dude, you don't know what you're playing with here. <laughs> okay. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice comes from heaven. Um, the fulfillment of the dream comes on him. The tree is cut down and he grazes with animals. He, he eats with the animals. He's humbled. He's driven from amongst his people to eat with the beasts of the field. He loses his mind. I think it's a mental illness that he's struck down with from what we can tell. Um, he's driven away from his people. He ate ox, the grass like an ox. Uh, he slept out in the fields with the cows until his hair grew like feathers of an eagle and nails grew. Finally, though, his sanity is given back. It seems that the punishment um, taught him a lesson. And we get to verse 34, which is the most exciting thing ever. Yeah. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. It's not just that he looked up, okay? He acknowledged the God of heaven, is what he's saying. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. <laughs> he had learned that. He's a Christian. You're going to see him one day. You can go and ask him what grass tastes like. <laughs> okay? He, he, he becomes a Christian. It's absolutely incredible. So what is a Christian? Someone who acknowledges that God is God and you're not. You know, the Lord is God and I'm not and gives all praise and honor and glory to the God of heaven. That's what a Christian is. Who changes their gods. If you change your God and start worshiping the God of heaven, you're a Christian. So what do you think would be more likely at the end of this whole lot, that these four worshippers, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would become Babylonians, or that the Babylonian king would become a worshipper? The other way around, absolutely. And most of Israel did become Babylonians. They took on the Babylonian culture. They intermarried with the Babylonians. They set up their shops, and they settled down and stayed. 
Even when Cyrus came to the throne and said you could go back, they didn't. Esther is an example. She stayed. She didn't go back to Judah. And who would have thought he becomes actually the greatest evangelist the world has ever seen? Because he writes this letter to the whole world. Poor old Billy Graham could only pop into a few stadia around the world. And a couple of hundred thousand people heard the gospel through his preaching. He writes a letter to the whole world. And guess what? This letter is still being read by the whole world. You can become a Christian by reading chapter 4 of Daniel. Because it's all about who God is and how we should respond to him. Um, he is able to humble the proud. <laughs> and he did with Nebuchadnezzar. I just love that story. So the lesson is, if Nebuchadnezzar can become a Christian, so can your auntie, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your child. You pray and you, and you, and you witness because God will use that to bring about a new creation in their hearts. So that's chapter 4. We're in the middle of our chiasm. Chapter 5, we meet the next king. Because now Nebuchadnezzar, his reign is over, and Belshazzar takes over. And I, th I think, if I'm not mistaken, he's Nebuchadnezzar's son. I'm almost sure he is. Um, there's a little bit of doubt in my head. I don't know why, but I think he is. Yeah, because it, um, in chapter 5, verse 2, Belshazzar, when he kissed the one, the rest of the gold so that Nebuchadnezzar's his father had taken. Yes. Yeah, there we go. So you, you would think, wouldn't you, <laughs> that the child of Nebuchadnezzar would have watched what happened to his father and learned a lesson. Well, let's see what happens. He throws this new, this new king comes to the throne. He throws this massive feast. Uh, and he uses for the feast the cups and the plates that were stolen from God's temple in Jerusalem and brought to the Babylonian temple uh, in Babylon. Um, as they were praising their gods, this terrifying hand appears and starts writing on the wall. Amazing. I mean, that English phrase, is still, we still use it. The writing's on the wall yeah. for the Blue Bulls this weekend because they're going to get such a whipping. You know, <laughs> we use that way of talking. So um, chapter 5, verse 6, uh, the writing starts... Um, the hand starts writing, the king watched the hand as it wrote, his face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees became weak, and his legs became weak, and his knees were knocking. I love the description. <laughs> Again, the wise men are called in to interpret this mysterious um, uh, text. Uh, they can't, it's not, it's not in, in, in uh, Aramaic, they can't read it. Um, and, and again, Daniel uh, is brought in. Um, I, they can read it, they can't understand it, sorry. So he has to come and interpret. And again, he reminds the next king of what he reminded the previous king, that only God can interpret dreams. It does tell you, doesn't it, that don't go down the line of trying to interpret dreams. <laughs> don't think you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Keep it. Yeah, dream interpreters. And even in Christian circles, yeah. there are people who are quite happy to try and interpret dreams for you and say they've had dreams and, and give the interpretation. But, I mean, God interprets dreams, uh, we're told here. Again, he says this, he reminds them, uh, and then uh, before he gives the king the interpretation, he just reminds Belshazzar of how King Nebuchadnezzar's father had been humbled um, and been brought down from his throne. Um, in chapter 5, verse 18, Your Majesty, the Most High God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. Those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne, stripped of his glory. He was driven away from his people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until, until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and sets over them whoever he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew... Oh, I can't turn pages with these braces on. Though you knew all this, instead, you have set yourself up against 
the Lord of heaven. It's quite a, it's quite a thing. <clears throat> um, do I need to keep reading? Yeah. Uh, you had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you uh, brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot hear or see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Belshazzar was meant to have been warned. He was meant to take the warning. Um, he has lifted up his hand against the God of heaven. And the interpretation and the consequences for his rebellion against God are then spelt out by, uh, by Daniel. Uh, therefore, God, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians, the next superpower of the world. Um, Instead of Belshazzar following his father's example and worshipping this god, he honors Daniel. Uh, he clothes him in purple, a gold chain is placed around his neck, he is proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom, and that very night he is killed. He does not honor the god of heaven. So what we... say he raised his hand, is it because he used the cups and plates yeah. in the temple? Yeah, and then, and then praised them as gods. Praised the gods of Babylon. Um, yeah. Yeah. I can't find it right now. They drank, verse 4, they drank the wine, they praised the gods. Is that what you're saying? They praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, and suddenly the, hand, the fingers of a human hand appear and write on the wall as they're praising the gods of, of gold and silver. Okay. So what we have here in the middle of our chiasm is two kings. Two kings have an encounter with God. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, with a dream, Belshazzar by writing on the wall. One heeds the warning. One repents and acknowledges and is judged by God. God. It really is a paradigm for us as the human race. You, you can follow one or two of the kings, one or two ways to live. You've got a choice to make. Are you going to acknowledge the God of heaven or are you going to continue in your disregard and your rebellion against the God of heaven? We all fall into one of those two camps. We all start out in the one camp, in Belshazzar's camp, as Nebuchadnezzar did. We are born into that camp, the camp of Adam. And the question is now, are you going to transfer allegiance? Are you going to change sides? Are you going to start acknowledging the God of heaven? It's a great passage to use to challenge people evangelistically. What are you going to do uh, with God? You can continue if you want, continue the way you are, but look what's going to happen to you. Or you can, you can learn Nebuchadnezzar's lesson and look what happened to him. Well, we now get to another rescue. Uh, chapter 6, where God has to come to the rescue of his faithful servants again. It's a mirror of chapter 3. The new king, Darius, comes to the throne. He's not a Babylonian. He is now a Mede. I think Darius the Mede. So the Medo-Persians, the, the kingdom of Mede and the kingdom of Persia, join together to defeat Babylon. So we've got this Medo-Persian alliance. of his country. Uh, Daniel's enemies, though, try and find a way to get him into trouble with this king. Uh, but because of his honesty, they, they can't get anything to stick. No charges will stick. Um, and so the, the, the only thing they can do is attack him in terms of his faith, because he's different in who he worships. Darius to pass an arrogant law that people can only pray to him, to Darius. 
they know that they're going to get Daniel. If they can get the king to pass that law, they've got him. Because they know Daniel will not. That's been proven over and over again. Daniel had always praised, prayed towards Jerusalem three times a day, we're told. And so he continues. He disregards the king's um, uh, edict. And that results with him being thrown into the lion's den. But just as with the men in the throne into the fiery furnace, God rescues Daniel again. And then Darius writes a letter to all the people of the world. We've heard this before, haven't we? Calling on them to worship Daniel's God. So chapter nine, uh, 7 verse 19. Um, no, 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 no. Why am I confused? Chapter 6 verse 19, sorry. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. He, he was reluctant. Well, he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know what he was going to be doing to Daniel by passing this decree. He just thought it was a good idea that people pray to him. And he liked Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. It's amazing how respectful Daniel is, eh? I think we should learn from that, with the way we talk about our president or other ministers or municipality leaders. May God send his angel, my God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. Um, the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted out of the den, no wound was found in him, because he had trusted in his God. It's exactly a mirror of there was no smell of burning. Remember, not even a smell of singeing. Amazing, when they pulled those three guys out of the furnace. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. Ooh. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. In other words, Daniel didn't survive because the lions weren't hungry. It's not that they'd just been fed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then King Darius wrote again to all the nations and the people of every language in all the earth. So we've had one king of Babylon writing to the world saying, commanding all people everywhere to repent. Have you heard those words in Acts? <laughs> The Lord commands all people everywhere to repent. Um, and now the king of the per Medo-Persians writes a letter to the whole world saying the same thing. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and, re and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the, per the Persian after Darius. So in chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego attempted to do what God had forbidden. Remember? They attempted to do what God had forgiven, that is to worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar, a sin of commission. If you come from any sort of Anglican background, uh, in, the, in the Anglican prayer book, they speak about sins of commission and sins of omission. And we are guilty of both. So I like to point out that uh, uh, what's name? David Warner was guilty of a sin of commission. He commissioned something. He did something consciously wrong. Uh, Steve Smith was guilty of a sin of omission. He failed to do what was right. He knew what he should do and didn't do it. And what sentence did they both get? The same. They were equally guilty in the eyes of the Australian Cricket Board. And that's the same with God. You can be the worst sinner on earth, or you can be someone who refuses to do anything about the sins of the earth, and you're equally liable uh, for judgment from God. So here we've got um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were tempted to commit sins of commission, to do something that God forbids. Shadrach, uh, Daniel is tempted to do... Uh, sorry, Shadrach, Daniel is tempted not to do what God commands, the sin of omission, in that he is told not to pray. And he says, I will pray. Can you see? Uh, it's, it's, another, it's another attack by Satan. There's two ways Satan can attack you and send you to hell, by tempting you to do wrong and tempting to you not to do right. And he's got you both ways. And we actually fall for both, don't we? You look back in your life and you've, you've 
blown us on both sides. <laughs> okay, and you look at Jesus' life. Did he ever fail to do right? Did he ever do wrong? No. He remained innocent. And then he gives us his perfection. He transfers his righteousness to us so that we are presentable and acceptable before God. Daniel 7, Daniel's dream. How are we doing for time here? Okay. When we come to chapter 7, it corresponds to the dream of chapter 2. Just a different king at this point. Uh, the Lord reveals in a vision to Daniel that he will establish an eternal kingdom uh, though one like this, sorry, through someone like the Son of Man who will be worshipped by all peoples and nations. Now this is a very, very important chapter going into the New Testament. Daniel chapter 7. It's, like, it's one of those you know, purple chapters, golden chapters. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, the promise to Abraham. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, the promise to David. Daniel 7. The, the promise of, um, of one like the Son of Man who is going to come to rescue the world. So Daniel has this vision, uh, chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, one of Jesus' favorite titles for himself. And when he calls himself the Son of Man, what do the Pharisees do? They pick up rocks, don't they? Because they know that when he calls himself the Son of Man, he's referring to this dream. He's saying, Daniel was dreaming about me. I am the son of man of Daniel 7. So let's see what's so important about the son of man of Daniel 7. The son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. And all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's what Jesus says is true of him. And the Pharisees rightly want to kill him because it's blasphemy unless it's true. <laughs> you know, to claim that you're the son of man of Daniel chapter 7. All people of every language must worship me, he says. Not God. Jesus says, don't, Jesus never says worship God. He says worship me. about ascension day. This is fulfilled at Jesus' ascension. Listen to the language again. What does Daniel see? He sees the Son of Man coming. Coming where? Towards where? Towards him. Towards him? He approaches the ancient. the ancient of Days. So it's not that he sees the Son of Man coming to earth. He sees the Son of Man returning from earth approaching the Ancient of Days, who is God the Father. He comes, he's ushered into the presence of God the Father, coming with the clouds of heaven. Do you remember in Luke and in Acts, the, uh, he was taken up whoops, with the clouds. The clouds take him up, and the clouds deliver him to the throne room of heaven, and he is led into the presence of the Ancient of Days. What does the Ancient of Days do? He gives him authority and glory and power and all nations and all people. The Ancient of Days bestows on the Son of Man everything. And he tells, the Ancient of Days tells the world to worship the Son of Man. It's the Father giving Jesus what he won at the cross. It's the Ascension Day. It's Jesus' coronation. And Daniel sees it all way, way, way before it happens. And so when Jesus waltzes around Israel saying, I'm the Son of Man, I'm the Son of Man, he's claiming that this is going to happen to him. He is going to be given by God the Father everything. So you guys better start worshipping me now. <laughs> because one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that I am Lord. You better do it now because you're going to have to do it then. It's great, isn't it? And then we see in verse 27, Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High, his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. So these are the key chapters of Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapters 1 through to 7. They describe the historical setting of the exile, uh, why the people are in exile. It reminds them of why. It tells them how God is going to rescue them. He's going to set up this, uh, a stone. He's going to demolish uh, their oppressors and going to set up an alternate kingdom that fills the whole earth. God encourages his people. Um, it also speaks to the kingdoms, the pagan kingdoms. Remember it's written in Aramaic. 
So it's not just a message for Israel in exile, it's also a message to the captive, captors of Israel, um, calling them to come and be forgiven and become part of this kingdom that's going to consume the world. It tells them that actually um, all the kings and all the kings of the world are under the control of this stone that God is going to set up, this son of man. Um, it reminds people that all God's plans and purposes and promises are still on track. Nothing is, nothing is going wrong here. Therefore, they should remain steadfast. Keep trusting God. Keep waiting on God to act. He's going to. He's told them what he's going to do. Uh, so just wait. They don't have to do anything. Just wait. Be faithful. Be, you know, um, uh, keep on honoring the Lord. Now, how do we apply this to ourselves? Uh, and then we'll have a, a break. How God protects a faithful remnant of people. So, I don't know, maybe 100,000 Jews, I can't remember, I think 44 returned. I think about 100,000 or something, anyway, a big number, left Israel, or Judah, and were taken to Babylon. Not all of them were faithful. We know a lot of them weren't. But here is a band of faithful brothers who remain faithful to the Lord, a remnant. They remain, remnant remain. And God provides, protects Looks, uh, looks after them, rescues them all the time, um, even though the odds are hugely stacked against them. You never think these guys are going to survive thrown into a fire, thrown into a lion's den. God is with his people in the exile. He's not limited to some little brick building in the middle of Jerusalem somewhere. He is not limited, in fact, by anything, not by time, not by space. And uh, One Peter tells us that actually this is a picture of us, now we are people, aliens, strangers in this world. We are people in exile. We are a remnant, trying to be faithful, doing the best we can, helping each other along to keep on trusting the Lord and waiting because we know what's going to happen. <laughs> this rock is coming. It's going to smash our oppressors. The enemies of God will be crushed, but you just got to hang in there. Just one more day. You don't have to worry about 20 years of being faithful. you just got to be faithful for 24 hours tomorrow. <laughs> That's, I can do do that. I reckon I can do that tomorrow. I can still trust Jesus for a day, and then the next day I can do the same thing again. That's all we're called to do as Christians. Just hang in there and watch, because God's about to do something absolutely amazing. God is with us. By his Spirit, he is with us, just like he was in the fire, in the den. God is with his people even when they deserve judgment. These people weren't innocently dragged off to Babylon. They were guilty. And remember, God handed them over to Nebuchadnezzar. And yet God is still with them. That's what grace is. Giving people what they don't deserve. Being with them despite their sin. He is an eternal ruler. He is a God of grace and mercy. He is Lord of every king and every kingdom. And we see that, of course, supremely on the cross. Where Jesus conquers the Romans. He conquers the Jewish um, resistance. He conquers everything, conquers death, he conquers Satan on the cross as he lords it over death. Remember Paul's lovely words in Corinthians, where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where's your victory? Come on. You've been conquered. You've been defanged. You've got nothing left. You can't scare me at all. And, of course, his resurrection is the greatest victory over death ever. It also tells us that God is going to bring blessings to the nations. Abraham language, going to bless the world. Um, through this king, this eternal king that he is going to provide, the son of man. Now this king of David, 2 Samuel 7, has got a name or a title. He is the son of man, we're told. Um, and it's written in Aramaic to say that actually God's kingdom is not going to just be Jewish. God's kingdom is going to be comprised of every nation under the sun. Now, I just want to mention one thing as we finish off, and that is something that Jeremiah mentions in his book, because he's writing it about the same sort of circumstances and time. Uh, he prophesied just before the exile, but he was talking about the exile. He was warning the people about what was coming in the future. And he spoke about a new covenant. A new covenant. So just a quick recap of where things stand in terms of the covenants God has made so far. He made this covenant with Abraham, which is unconditional. I will bless you, and I will bless the whole world through you. Then he made a covenant with David, unconditional. I will put one of your descendants on your throne. Come, hello, how water. You can't stop me doing it. No one can stop me doing it. And then he made a covenant with Moses, which 
was conditional. If you are faithful, then you will be my people and I will be your God. And that, of course, was continually broken. They could not be faithful, ever, the Jews. And so it is broken, which leaves this, this huge question of how God is going to ever manage to fulfill his promises when some of them are conditional on our obedience. Um, it just seems that it's impossible, and it actually is. The answer to this whole thing is that God promises a new covenant. It's not a covenant that's going to replace the previous. It's not like there was a problem with the first covenants, but this, is, this covenant is going to be a, not, a new way that God deals with his, uh, with his people. No, it's not on the basis of obedience. The, the unconditional covenants remain. They still stand. These two aren't affected. But this covenant, the conditional one, is replaced with the new covenant. Not of obedience, but of what does God require from his people today? Not obedience. Right. Faith. Exactly. By faith, Abraham walked with God and was justified, declared not guilty. So you've got two options. You can either try and get to heaven by being obedient and good luck to you. I've tried that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or you can get to heaven through faith. Faith in what? Faith in the one who did keep the conditional covenant. He did love the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, strength. He always worshipped God with, with everything. He kept the Ten Commandments for us. So that when we put our faith in him, his, uh, the merits of his life are given to you and I. And we arrive at the pearly gates looking beautiful. <laughs> you know, looking pure, spotless, without blemish. Because we arrive there with Christ's righteousness. Not our own, because that was taken by him and punished on the cross. So Jeremiah 31, verse 31. That's an easy one to remember. Eh? Jeremiah 31, 31. You can, anyone can remember that. That's what this says. The days are coming, declares the Lord. For now will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenants I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Remember, we looked at that Hosea, tragic story of Hosea last week. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts instead of on tablets of stone. It will now be written on the heart. I will be their God, they will be my people. Notice it's not conditional. I will, I will, I will, I will, says God. No longer will they each teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Isn't it just marvelous what God does for us in our sin? We can't help, we are weak, we cannot even come close to making our way towards him. So the promise of the new covenant comes, which is the solution to this great problem of a conditional covenant. Um, it becomes conditional that if Jesus keeps it, then we will be people of the new covenant. And of course he does. Satan does everything in his power to make sure Jesus can't keep it. Starting out by trying to kill every baby under two years old in Bethlehem. But then the temptations in the desert. Do you remember? The temptations from the temple. They're all there to try and get Jesus to do something that will break the conditional terms of the, of the covenant with Moses. If he can get Jesus to break one condition, he's won the day. He's got our soul locked up forever. But he can't. Jesus prevails. And the new covenant is established by Jesus. And it becomes unconditional. God will do this for anyone Anyone who puts their faith in the Savior that he provides to live out this for us. Just very quickly, looking ahead, um, when we look to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 onwards, says that Jesus is the mediator of this new covenant. It will never be broken. It can't be, because he kept it. Romans chapter 5 picks this up and says that Jesus' righteousness is given to death-deserving lawbreakers yeah. like Nebuchadnezzar and like Bronnie and Craig <laughs> and me. <laughs> death-deserving sinners are given Jesus' righteousness if death-deserving sinners put their faith in Jesus, the Son of Man. Well, let's leave it there and have a cup of tea. Awesome, man. Eh? What a book. <laughs> Are you going to do uh, 8 to 12 verses? Um, we can, uh, 
what's the time? Let me let me say a quick word on the, on the rest of the book of Daniel. Okay, we won't go through everything in detail because it's actually a, a rerun. Everything has been covered now. By the time we get to chapter seven, um, basically chapter two to seven, which we've covered, is what God is going to do, and then a nine to twelve is when is God going to do this? That's that's how the book is broken up. Um, so in chapter eight, we get a, a vision of the final uh, two beasts of chapter seven. And we're told what their destiny is, the ram and the goat, which I think refer to the, the Medo-Persian Empire followed by the Greek Empire, the next two empires that are going to come against God and his people. Um, the goat, we're told, has horns, which represent kings, uh, like Belshazzar, who rebel against God. Um, and and those, those horns are picked up in Revelation. You remember, John picks up this beast with many horns. It's a picture straight out of Daniel. And they are going to be destroyed uh, by God. Oh. No, it's actually a, it's, it's a huge truck that's working next to hitting a speed bump. I had this all day. I don't even remember. Um, so God is going to destroy these kings to raise themselves up against him. Um, we're told in chapters 10 through to 12, it's the final vision, um, and it's the same sequence of kings repeated again. It really is just a summary of chapters 8 and 9, or repeated in 10 to 12. Um, and the kings that are, are picked up, you know, John picks up these kings uh, that represent kingdoms set up against God and against his people in any age, I think. Um, I think we would be foolish to try and say, oh, we're now in the age of the Soviet Empire. We're now in the age of the North Koreans. It's just a picture of kings who, who oppress God's people and try and, and wipe God's uh, people out and what happens to them. And they get absolutely crushed. Um, so we'll leave it at that, but uh, there, it really is just taking what chapters 2 to 7 have taught us and applying it to the kings and the empires around God's people uh, that they are going to go through until Christ comes. So I think an important point to note is that I think uh, the rest of the book of Daniel has been fulfilled. It's, it's, it's talking about the kings that are going to be against God's people until God's king comes and crushes them. Um, yeah, it's not that we should try and search in there for, you know, future things or things in our time, the EU or whatever. Um, I think they're, they've already been fulfilled. And Christ has crushed all opposition on the cross. And now it's really a mopping up operation. Um, the big victory has been won, you know, the, the, in, in Germany and Japan during the war. The main battle had been won, but then there were these mopping up operations that had to happen as they overcame pockets of resistance in Berlin or some islands in the South Pacific that were still run by the Japanese. They had to get neutralized and sorted out. But the battle was over. The war was won. There's just no way anyone else was going to you know, take over uh, from, from Britain and the Allies. And it's like that now. We're living in that age of mopping up operation. The devil has been defanged. Death has been defeated. Um, every now and again, a particularly strong pocket will pop up and cause misery for the saints, but God will sort them out. Yeah. And finally, Christ will return and uh, destroy any other resistance that's still around. Is that right? Yeah. Not satisfactory, I know, but we go on next week to the post-exilic period. Once the people come back under Cyrus, what happens then? So try and read Ezra and Nehemiah for as much of it as you can. Right, well, let's have a break for... 10 minutes or so, there's tea, coffee, some, I think some <coughs> rolls that Belinda's bought. Ah, Bron has bought chocolate biscuits. Great, thanks. Okay, we've got 15 minutes left, so we're just going to have a much lighter time. It's always quite nice to whew, just uh, slow down a bit and, and have some fun with various passages as we learn how to do. Um, get it right as we try and understand how to handle passages from the Bible. And so we've looked at five steps up to now, and we, tonight we get to study the section and the book. So we've gone from words to sentences to passages, and now sections and books, whole books. Um, it's really important to consider two things, content and context, as you're reading parts of the Bible. I mean, some of those passages from Daniel, you can take out of there and... Uh, stick them up on your wall or behind your toilet, 
but actually, it, 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 without a context, without knowing where they come from in the Bible and what the situation was around Daniel, when he said whatever he said, well, you can make it say whatever you want to make it say. You know, you're not doing justice to what the passage was saying at the time. And of course, there's, there's great examples of that, aren't there? You know, um, uh, people who are called by my name, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and da da da. You take that verse, you don't even know where it comes from, and you don't even know who it was said to or why it was said, and you say, that's me, you know. But actually, it's, it's very clear in the first few words of that particular example that if my people, who are called by my name, which are God's chosen people of under the old covenant, not Christians, under the new covenant. So immediately, whatever comes next can't apply to me. It applied to them. Now, I can draw principles from that, and, and certain things that were true of them are still true for me, but not everything that was true for Israel is true of me. Okay? I can't say that I'm a perfect match for, you know, the church is a perfect match for ancient Israel. Um, for instance, when the church sins, God doesn't send us to Babylon. Okay? <laughs> so off you go to Iraq for 70 years. You know? So um, we must be very careful of context. As someone, some wise guy says, a text without a context is a con. <laughs> okay? <laughs> You take the text out of context, you're left with a con. Uh, context is everything. Um, you know, there is no God. The Psalms say that twice. Psalm 14, Psalm 49. There is no God. But then you go and read the context. It's the fool who says there is no God. Okay? You're a fool if you say that. So you've got to be very, very careful about taking a verse. And that becomes your life. I've heard that the other day. Uh, my life verse is this. I've never heard of a life verse before, but anyway. Um, so, uh, how do we how do we deal with context? I think you've got the diagram of the circles. Yeah, it looks like a, a Spitfire plane, um, a target. But what we have in the middle is our particular passage that that we might be interested in. But around that passage, uh, there's a certain section of a book. So, for instance, if you're in Daniel chapter four. Am I right? I'm thinking, trying to think of the back of the diagram. Uh, you immediately know, okay, where am I? I know what's happened in Daniel chapter 2. That was the fiery, uh, the fiery furnace. Chapter, <laughs> someone help me here. Chapter 3 was... Chapter 3 was the fiery furnace. Chapter 3 was the fiery furnace. Chap the, dream. Ch oh, the, the dream and 2, the fiery furnace and 3, Nebuchadnezzar and 4. So I immediately can't know what's happened before. Okay, here's this arrogant man who's thrown God's people into the fire. And so when I get to the end of chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar does this amazing turnaround. I know what's come, what's led to it, you know. Yeah. Or I might be in chapter 3 when he does an amazing turnaround. Okay, and it looks genuine. Remember that, yeah, you know, you don't speak against those people's God. And, and, and you get all excited or you go and preach that as if, as if the man is saved. He's not because, you know, the context now. And you know what's coming in chapter 4. Around that is the book. What book am I in, in the Bible? Um, uh, in this case, Daniel. That's important because what sort of language, um, what genre, uh, which is literary style genre, uh, is Daniel written in? Well, I mean, just we haven't gone into those latter chapters, but the genre is called apocalyptic, which is exactly the same genre as the book of Revelation. Now, there are rules that apply to different genres. There's still rules today that apply to different genres. So if you're reading narrative, there's certain rules that apply. that don't apply when you're reading historical documents. And there's certain rules that apply when you're reading poetry that don't apply when you're reading narrative. You know, so in the Song of Solomon, when he, you know, he, he says, you know, your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. He uh, like heard of sheep. <laughs> and we'll stop there because he describes a few other parts of the human body. <laughs> Moving on. But you know, you, 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 not just subconsciously, you're consciously applying certain rules of interpretation because you know that you're in the Book of Solomon, Song of Solomon. You're not going to take that literally, you know, what sort of knows? Pinocchio didn't get, you know, Tower of Lebanon or something. Um, so you apply certain literary rules to certain different genres. When you come to a book of Daniel, and suddenly you're faced with this apocalyptic genre, 
Well, you've got some homework to do because you've got to go and read what is apocalyptic literature, where did it come from? We don't have anything like it today. I think Harry Potter might be close to apocalyptic. That's sort of, you know what I'm talking about? Um, or Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, what do they call that genre today? Fantasy. Fantasy. But it's not just wild fantasy in Lord of the Rings. It's highly symbolic fantasy. Highly symbolic. And, and, and you, you watch it over and over again. Each time you see something new, the symbolism that's built in the matrix, the symbolism and, and the names that are chosen, um, you know, Leo, why is that guy's name Leo, yeah, etc. You know, the blue pill, the red pill, uh, all of these things are hugely symbolic, but they're, fan they're fantasy. It's not true. It's not science fiction either, which is a completely different genre. Um, and we've got to understand that when we're talking about Revelation, Daniel, you can't take things um, quantitatively. Uh, sorry, you can't take things qualitatively. You take them quantitatively. That's one of the basic rules of apocalyptic literature. They are not quantities, they are qualities. So when you talk about three and a half years, which Daniel does and John picks it up when he writes Revelation, suddenly you're, you're in apocalyptic. So you're not going to take that literally, are you? It's like saying the nose was literally like a Tower of Lebanon. It's a quality. What does the quality of three and a half mean? Well, it's half of seven. What is the quality of seven in the Bible? Completeness. So what does three and a half mean? Half complete. What is 666 a quality of? Not quite seven. It's falling short at every turn. At every attempt to be seven and falls short. You're not going to make the mistake of taking it qualitatively. Wrong. Quantitatively. It's not a quantity. It's a quality. It's symbolic of something. Um, I remember going at Varsity, before I was a Christian, I got invited to some talk, um, some visiting speaker, and they were talking about from the book of Revelation, and the locusts, you know, the vision of the locusts, and so, and the guy was saying, they represent the MiG fighter planes coming from Russia, you know, and I was taken in, I didn't know anything, I wasn't a Christian, until you realize, actually, who was that written for? It was written for first century Christians to understand. And there was no such thing as a MiG fighter plane in the first century. So whatever else it means, it cannot mean the Russian invasion. Okay? It simply can't mean that. Otherwise, for 2,000 years, the book of Revelation has been a closed book, and it's not. The book of Revelation promises a blessing for anyone who reads it. Anyone who reads it. Not just 21st century readers. First century readers, especially first century readers, would have understood it with no problem at all. We're the ones that have got a problem. So, quantity versus quality, quantitative versus qualitative. And it all comes down to which book in the Bible are you working with? Is it narrative, like you know, Exodus? Or is it history? Or is it, um, and sometimes books mix it up, don't they? You have a book that's got a bit of poetry, a bit of narrative, a bit of history all put together. And you've got to apply different rules as you move from section to section. So yeah. how do we know yeah, it's a very good question. Some of it's easy. Poetry is easy, you know. And in fact, the editors of the NRV do us a favor because whenever they hit something, I mean, I'm just, I've got acts open, I don't know why. And suddenly there's a little bit of poetry and they, they indent it for you to show this is poetry. It's either a quote from the Old Testament, a poetic part of the Old Testament, uh, or it's a, you know, sometimes the writers are quoting from, from, from secular poets. Um, all Cretans are glazy gluttons and Da, 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 da. That will be indented for you to know, okay, this is poetry. In other words, not all people from Crete are gluttons, but you get the idea. <laughs> okay? It's qualitative, not quantitative. It's not all does not mean all when it comes to something like that, because you're now in poetry. But when it says all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved, now that's quantity, because you're no longer in poetry. Now you're in narrative. You see how important it is? So words change their meaning depending on what genre the writer is using. Historical is fairly simple because it's history. It's a, a book of one and two kings. And then so-and-so lived for so many years and then he died and, and he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as his father had done. And his son so-and-so took over. That's history. Um, uh, narrative is conversations between people. 
David and Goliath, this narrative, this wonderfully graphic picture, and we, we get involved in, and it's, it could be acted out, actually. You could put it out on stage. Hard to put history or poetry on stage, but narrative is great for stage. Um, and so you're kind of aware of it as you go through subconsciously. You, you're making, you know, when you read the, the tell witness, you, you're going to be applying certain rules to it compared to when you pick up your favorite book of Shakespeare. You know, you're not going to apply the tell witness rules to Hamlet. You're not going to do it. Um, not because you're particularly clever, but, you know, you listen to a song on the radio and suddenly it's often qualities that have been spoken of, not quantities, because it's poetry put to music. But yeah, it's a very good question and a very important thing. Make sure you have done the hard work of thinking about what have I got in front of me? Is it a letter? New Testament is full of letters. Well, then I must read it like a letter. It's written from someone to someone with a purpose. And there was an occasion. There was a, a, an incident that happened that led to this letter being written. It wasn't written for fun. It wasn't written for me, Christchurch, Howick, Hilton, whatever. It was written to that church in Colossae. So what was going on in that church in Colossae? Why should Paul write a letter to them? Got to do that hard work. Otherwise, you're going to be taking a letter to Colossians and applying it straight to Howick and making a mess of everything. But you can take the principles. I mean, he, how's my time? I'm really going crazy here. But <laughs> 1 Corinthians is a classic, you know. I've, I've, I've heard it said that, oh, I wish we could be more like the Corinthian church. Well, you, the last thing you want ever is to be like the Corinthian church. <laughs> it was a total, total disaster. That was why Paul had to write the letter. Because it was such a shambles. And every single point, on every page, He's rebuking them for false doctrine, bad behavior, crazy ideas. And so when you come across something like every man must have his own wife, how are you going to preach that in Howick? Yeah, everyone must get married. All Christians should get married. It's really wrong if you don't get married because the Bible says every man should have his own wife. But the point is every man should have his own wife. And the word have means sex. Okay? Don't have another man's wife. And don't have a person that you're not a wife, that's not a wife to you. If you're going to have a girl, he's speaking politely, have your own wife. In other words, what is it with you guys and the sexual immorality going on? So can you see, it's important to know what was going on in Corinth. And Corinth was the cesspool of the world. Uh, to Corinthicize was a way of describing someone who was sexually immoral. The word Corinth becomes a verb, well, an adjective. You're a Corinthicizer. Well, that's fallen out of vogue today, but you could use it today. You could look it up in a dictionary. To Corinthicize means to carouse, you know, to go on, debauched. Yeah, well, we digress. <laughs> but a Bible teacher has got to take his job seriously because the lot rests on getting the text right. I mean, get it right. Which book are you in? Which testament are you in? And are you under the New Covenant or Old Covenant? Which testament? Um, and then finally, you're in the Bible. You're not in some secular book. So what's it going to be about? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> okay. If it's in the Bible, it's about Jesus. Uh, first and foremost, it's about Jesus. What is the Daniel teaching me about Jesus? Well, I hope we've seen tonight. The rock. Okay. It's about Jesus and what Jesus is going to come and do. And from their point of view, what he's going to do. From our point of view, what he did what he came and did for us. Yeah. So the literary context, reading within the book. So we often rush from the Bible to ourselves. I'm looking at that little triangle there where you've got the text of the Bible and we go straight to ourselves with a big cross in that arrow down the right. Don't do that. You can't go straight from the text to yourself because it wasn't addressed to Andy Pike. It was addressed to Timothy or to Titus or from Moses to the Israelites, or from whatever to whatever, but I don't see Andy Park's name anywhere in the Bible. So you can't go that route, straight from the text to yourself. You've got to go via the original audience. You've got to say, what was Paul saying to Timothy? Then you can go from Timothy to yourself. Okay, if that was true for Timothy, what is true for Andy? Okay, some things aren't going to be true for Andy. Women, cover your heads. Men, don't shave your sideburns. I mean, those are injunctions. Do not get a tattoo. Those are injunctions from the book, from God, but to whom? Not Andy. To his people. So his people are to be distinct when they go into the promised land 
They've got a new God, a different God. They have to look different, smell different, eat different, dress different, different hairstyle. Why? Because they're different. So if the nations ask them about their God, which is this God that says that you mustn't cut your sideburns? Obviously, in the promised land, everyone cut their sideburns. Obviously, in the promised land, everyone had tattoos, everyone uh, ate pork, everyone, what else, worked on Saturdays. You go in there, you don't work on Saturdays, you don't shave your sideburns, you don't eat pig. To look different, to be distinct. Don't get tattoos, because they do. Do get circumcised, because they don't. You will be different. You're a people, a, a different people. So now what has that got to say to Andy today? Can you see I've gone via the original intended audience. What does that say to Andy about tattoos? Nothing. <laughs> so nothing to do with tattoos. But it is still saying be different, Andy. If you call yourself a Christian, you are to be different. By this you will know that they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love love replaces distinctiveness, because actually only Christians really do love sacrificially and and expecting nothing in return. Uh, that's what makes you distinctive. Get a tattoo if you want, but get one that you won't regret. <laughs> if you really want a tattoo, I don't think God's too fussed about that. It's got to be a scripture. It's got to be a scripture. <laughs> John 3, 16. Yeah. <laughs> or a tattoo. <laughs> what's, what's it got to do with hairstyle? Nothing. You can shave your sideburns if you want. But still, you, you, you have the option of sh shaving your sideburns. You have the option of not being circumcised. You have the option of not covering your heads. You have the option of eating pork, but you don't have the option of not being different. You have to be different. If you call yourself my people, you must be different. And you must stand out like sore thumbs in your culture for whatever that means. Now you go and work it out, says God. Go and work it out, what it means to stand out like a sore thumb in your culture. It might mean getting a tattoo. <laughs> I don't know. It might. Uh, but can you see, we must be very careful not to take the, just things at, at face value. Um, we need to understand why those things were said and to whom they were said and why at that point were they said. Um, because the principle remains, but the outworking of the principle could look very, very different depending on your culture, your race, the age that you're living in. Um, I've mentioned it before, and I want to mention again that in the old days, when you read an ancient work, or anyone's work, actually not ancient, but if you if you read someone's work, you, you try to get into their mind. You try to work out what does he mean by what he said? Why did he say it like this and not that? Why does, you know, uh, the great literary works? Um, nowadays, in modern liter literary studies, um, it's not the author intent that's so important. It's the reader's perception that's most important. It's postmodern. So actually, forget about what the author meant or why he wrote it or she wrote it. That's not important, you are told in the universities today. What's important is what is it saying to you? What is this passage saying to you? Because that's what it means. You heard that said before? Ooh. I mean, you're just throwing every, every rule of reading literature out the window when you do that. It's, it means what it meant then. It doesn't mean what it means now. You can't change its meaning. What Paul meant then is what he still means today. You can't say, well, times have changed. Da, 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 you know. I feel that this is saying to me this, but to you it's saying something different. No, no, no. What it meant then to those people intended by that author is what it meant and what it means. Now work out the principle through Christ to what it means for us today and our people. It's very, very important. So then that goes with the of the idea of my own way of interpreting. Yeah. But what you're saying is no. should be the same. Let me put it like this. Your way of interpreting the scripture shouldn't come up with an answer that would surprise Paul. Like he's saying, what? <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> you know? I didn't intend Yeah, or, exactly, I did not mean for that to be read like that. He's like, if Paul was in the room, the author, whoever, Moses, you know, it's it, it, whatever you come up with, it meaning cannot be a surprise to them. Because then you've actually, you veered away from their intention of writing it, why they wrote it in the first place. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice, simple 
solution have? What would Paul say to this interpretation of the Bible, of his letter? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And for that, you have to read really the whole Bible. Yeah. That's big yeah, the big picture, absolutely, yeah. So why does Paul quote that psalm here? Psalm 110, he loves quoting Psalm 110. Why? Go and read Psalm 110, you know. What's it all about? Jesus quotes it as well and traps, remember, he traps the Pharisees. Why did David say, you know, the Lord said to my Lord, you know, come and sit at my right hand. Now, who's David, who's the Lord, and who's my Lord? You know, And he caught the Pharisees by quoting Psalm 110. Now you've got to go and do some work in the Old Testament, don't you? Before you can hope to understand what Jesus is doing there. So ask these questions. Who wrote the book? Who was the author? <laughs> Someone, who is it? They asked me who wrote Daniel. I felt like an idiot when I said I don't know. I actually don't know who wrote Daniel. I always assumed it's Daniel, but I have no reason to believe that, to, to believe that that's true. So someone needs to look that up for me. Um, but certainly some parts were not written by Daniel because they're written by Nebuchadnezzar and Darius and, and people like that. So anyway, ask the question, especially when it comes to the New Testament. That's really important. Who wrote this book? Was it Peter? Because actually whenever you read Peter's letters, he keeps harping on about how he betrayed Jesus three times. It's, it, it colors all his writing. It's with him. It's with him his whole life that he denied Christ three times. You go and read his letters and you'll see it there. You go and read Mark's gospel, which is actually Peter's gospel written down by Mark. It's Peter's gospel. Go and read it and see how, what, what role Peter plays in Mark's gospel. You'll see it was Peter who wrote that book. Um, uh, and you can see that it was um, Mark who wrote it because he talks about this young man who ran away naked. You know, and it's, That's Mark himself. A shame that he didn't stand. For Christ. Um, sorry? No, uh, the young man at the arrest of Jesus, they try to grab him and they end up with his coat and he ran away naked into the night. This is, this is probably Mark. Um, but yeah, go and try and work out who wrote it. Uh, what do we know about this situation? Um, so just a couple of examples, then we'll call it a night. Oh, we should call it a night already. But um, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, Paul writes, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. What is a trustworthy saying? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Now, is he exaggerating? Is he trying to put on a false piety there? I'm the worst. No, he killed Christians. He hated Jesus and he cast himself. The you can see how that part of his past st sticks with him as he writes these words of whom I am the worst, but for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, twice he says it, Christ Jesus may display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Uh, when you know Paul's history and you read that, suddenly, oh, you can feel it. You can feel it for the guy. Hey? Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there because it's, it's about 10 past, so I've gone way over time. We'll pick it up there from, from next week. Yeah. But thanks, guys. I don't know about you, but I love it. I have such fun. <laughs> so thank you for letting me have fun. <laughs> Bye, Bye,